Christmas came early for you guys down in Houston, Texans, as officially Bill O'Brien has been relieved of his duties by the Houston Texans as the active working head coach slash general manager slash trainer slash staff member slash executive vice president owner. Why not just give that title to him? Punter, kicker, quarterback, everything else in between. Trying to be the Bill Belichick of the Houston Texans and try to create a dynasty, having all this control. Unfortunately, it did not pan out for him after an 0-4 start being relieved of his duties by the Houston Texans. Him and many more coaches on the hot seat that we're going to get into in this new episode of Time to Football. Glad that you guys are joining us. My name is Hassan Khan, the host of this show. It's another Wednesday night, and it's another show that you guys are probably watching on YouTube. But if you guys are watching this on YouTube, on the computer, I'm waving you guys right here on the side in the chat. Make sure you guys are chatting with us, interacting with us. I'm going to be present in the chat so you guys can ask your questions uh, as we watch this premiere and this watch this show live every Wednesday night. Vice versa, if you're watching this up on YouTube and you don't want to watch a 45-minute video up on YouTube, makes a lot of sense. You can listen to us on the go. Uh, on the iTunes app, search for Time to Football. Subscribe to us on there. Rate and review. Five stars, nothing less. And listen to us on the go. But you guys that are joining us for the chat, we get the same people every single week. You guys are loyal fans. We appreciate that. Uh, I think last week we want to give a shout out. I, there was someone named Plant Lady Brit. I don't know if you're joining us right now, but hey, Plant Lady Brit, if you're joining us, how you doing? Uh, also, Yaya is the name of his YouTuber, uh, his YouTube username. He's uh, he's got the little Kobe Bryant avatar. I hope I'm pronouncing it right, Yaya. But a lot to unpack for the show with the head coaches that are on the hot seat. We talked about Bill O'Brien. We're going to talk a little bit more about that and get into the depth with the Houston Texans and how it kind of all unraveled and what's next for the Texans. We also want to talk about the Jets with Adam Gase. Oh my gosh, I was actually surprised that Adam Gase still has a job and Bill O'Brien doesn't. But maybe that's going to be coming up for the New York Jets next on their plays to fire Adam Gase. Dan Quinn of the Atlanta Falcons is also on the hot seat after those two blown leads just in 2020, and it's not just the Super Bowl that he has a blown lead, but there's other games in between where he's blown a lot of leads. We're going to dive into that as well, as well as Matt Patricia of the Detroit Lions, not very well liked according to a lot of players that are former players or current players from the Detroit Lions. So we're going to unpack all of that. Big shout out first to Feedspot.com for naming us as one of the top 100 NFL podcasts in the world. Not just competing with everybody in the United States, but all across the, the globe with podcasts in the United Kingdom, in Ireland, everywhere. We are ranked in the top 100 by Feedspot.com. And this list com uh, has established podcasts such as Around the NFL, which is the NFL's official podcast. ESPN's NFL Live, which is ESPN's official NFL podcast, being ranked alongside those names is such a huge honor. So thank you, Feedspot.com, for making us or ranking us in the top 100. It would not be possible if it weren't for you, the Time to Football faithful, and all the fans. Before we get into the topics, we have to give the most prestigious award on the show, the Hungriest Player of the Week. Hungriest player of the week, the one that wanted it the most. By the way, if you guys are watching this video up on YouTube, I don't mean to be a distraction by swaying back and forth so much, but this chair is actually a brand new chair. Check it out. Makes a lot of noise, but I promise I'll never do that again. But it's awesome just swaying back and forth and not being in one solid fold-up WWE chair that I was sitting in for so long. But the hungriest player of the week of week four, the one that wanted it the most, had the best performance and overcame the odds, doubted by everyone, by the media, by, by fans, saying that he lost a step, saying that he wasn't a good player. This guy showed up and he showed up big with the Cincinnati Bengals. That's right. Running back Joe Mixon is your week four hungriest player of the week 25 attempts 181 total yards three total touchdowns had six receptions on top of that for you guys that play fantasy football that own joe mixon you guys were like oh my gosh i'm scared i'm worried i don't know what to do i drafted this guy in the second round he's supposed to be my rb1 or my rb2 and he's just not producing i warned you guys to please be patient with joe mixon we saw this 
at the end, at the tail end of 2019, the second half of the season, first half didn't do much. People had buyer's remorse. Why did I draft this guy? Second half, he came on strong towards the end to where in, in our 2019 Fantasy Football Time of Football Awards, we named Joe Mixon as our most patient player award. We gave him that award, meaning that you have to have the most amount of patience with him, and he's going to show up big and pay dividends later on in the season. And the same thing was happening. First four weeks, what do we do? Joe Mixon, I, he sucks. He's not. He lost a step. He's not as good as he used to be. Guys, be patient. There's another play that we're going to talk about when we answer fantasy football questions, Kenyon Drake. So wait around for the end of the show if you guys are a Kenyon Drake owner. We're going to answer some questions revolving around him. But those two guys, we warned you guys that the whole entire season, please be patient because that Joe Mixon game is going to come. And it came against the Jacksonville Jaguars, putting up over 30 points and helping the Cincinnati Bengals Give Joe Burrow his first victory in the NFL. And that is why Joe Mixon is your week four hungriest player of the week. The hungriest player of the week has been copyrighted by Time to Football because this award was developed by us first in 2013. Not the check down, not the NFL, no matter what they post on their Instagram. I'm a little salty. Go back on previous episodes if you want to hear the story about that. But the hungriest player is Joe Mixon. Now to get into the main topics for this episode of Time to Football, a lot of head coaching candidates on the hot seat. One, after an 0-4 start, has already been fired, and that is Houston Texans head coach slash general manager slash executive vice president slash owner slash punter, kicker, quarterback, defensive end, Manta Taya's girlfriend. He wanted full control, and it ended up biting him in the butt. Bill O'Brien has been fired by the Houston Texans, and he is no longer the active uh, general manager or head coach of the Houston Texans. Instead, the interim head coach for the time being is going to be their defensive coordinator, Romeo Cornell, who's actually a very well-respected uh, coach in the NFL, whether he's a head coach or a defensive coordinator. But for Bill O'Brien, what does this mean for B.O.B.? Cal McNair, the owner for the Houston Texans who took over after his father passed away, had enough of this. He was like, you know what, we're out. We're done. We trusted you. We want to give you full control. You wanted to be the Bill Belichick of the Houston Texans to just build this dynasty and do all these things because you come from this Bill Belichick coaching tree. We trusted you. We really did. And even though you had some good seasons, yeah, you made the postseasons for a number of consecutive uh, years. You had six playoff games. Yeah, that's that's great and all, but the trades and the transactions that that you made, we just don't get it. We don't understand, so we're moving on. So Bill O'Brien has been relieved of his duties after putting up a 52-48 to 48 record, which is actually kind of an even number. It's kind of cool. He uh, coached 100 games. So they fired him after his 100th game. So congratulations on that milestone. Uh, two and four in the postseason in the playoffs, and it kind of unraveled a little bit after all the transactions and all the trades and all the playoff losses that – Bill O'Brien and the Houston Texans suffered following the, I would say, after 2018, going into maybe 2019. Uh, there's a lot of transactions. We're going to read off a few of these. The the most important and the most recent that uh, comes to everybody's minds is getting rid of DeAndre Hopkins, a top three wide receiver in the NFL, for basically not too much. And that, that's not discrediting David Johnson and Brandon Cooks because I think those guys are good players. But Bill O'Brien felt like, hey, maybe I'm playing Madden franchise mode. Maybe I can get someone like Brandon Cooks, get a second round pick out of DeAndre Hopkins as well, get David Johnson. And by the way, when I say Brandon Cooks, they eventually used the second round picks that they got. They had two second round picks and they used one of them to get Brandon Cooks from the Rams. So essentially it was DeAndre Hopkins for uh, Brandon Cooks and David Johnson at the end of the day. But maybe I could just get David jo or David Johnson and Brandon Cooks, and I could just put up the same amount of numbers in this Madden franchise mode with Brandon Cooks as DeAndre Hopkins, because we all know Madden. They don't use the. There's no difference between using Brandon Cooks and DeAndre Hopkins in the game. Maybe I could just do that. But this is real life, and DeAndre Hopkins is much more talented than almost, if not every single wide receiver in the NFL. Now I know there's Michael Thomas up there. I know there's Julio Jones. I know there's 
plenty of good wide receivers out there, but DeAndre Hopkins is definitely in the top three of that echelon. And Brandon Cooks, David Johnson, like I said, probably good players, probably decent players, and they've put up some good numbers so far for the Houston Texans, but too inconsistent, not not consistent enough to lead the Houston Texans to that postseason or that Super Bowl that Bill O'Brien wanted uh, the team to have. But following that loss against the Minnesota Vikings, where they lost 31-23, to off of a controversial touchdown pass to Will Fuller, I, I will admit that. But after losing that game, Bill O'Brien stated that every transaction that he made was for the best interest for the team. And a lot of people were puzzled by that statement. It doesn't make a lot of sense when you get rid of Hopkins for uh, Brandon Cooks and David Johnson. Also, if we want to look a year prior to that, at the beginning of of 2019 during the preseason they made another trade to acquire more players and that was Laramie Tunsil and Kenny Stills from the Miami Dolphins what did they trade away first round picks two of them and a second round pick for Laramie Tunsil good offensive lineman great offensive lineman one of the best in the NFL but Kenny Stills good receiver not great not your number one for any team a good piece and a good player for you to have depth on your wide receiver uh, depth chart, but not enough to for a first round pick or two first round picks. But I think the bulk of that came from from Laramie uh, Tunsil that the Miami Dolphins, if they're willing to trade Tunsil, let's get the most out of Bill O'Brien. And he bit on it. He bit, and he did it. And he a lot of crazy transactions happen and. You look where they're at right now. Yeah, Tunsil has done his job. Stills has done his job here and there. But it's just you could have used a lot more you, with that capital that you had in the in the 2020 NFL draft. You needed defensive line help. You need help in the secondary. And instead, you chose to get rid of all of that and get these players. That I, I just I don't know. I, I'm having a hard time. I, I'm I'm trying to be you know, as positive as possible because I am not a head coach slash general manager slash staff member slash executive vice president slash owner slash punter, kicker, quarterback, um, and everything else in between. Troy Palomalo's hair, I'm not, I'm none of those. But Bill O'Brien just didn't make a lot of sense with the uh, transactions that he made. And then I think the final thing, if you want to look a little bit prior to that, the final transaction that I picked up on that I thought was kind of you know, if he was, uh, Jadavion Clowney trading him away for a third round pick. Third round? He's one of the best pass rushing uh, players in the NFL and destructive, a former number one overall pick. You pick, you throw him away for basically a third, a third round pick. You could have gotten at least one first rounder out of that. You could have gotten a first rounder out of DeAndre Hopkins, but you chose not to do that. You could have uh, uh, traded away less for Larry Tunsil and Kenny Stills. You could have but you didn't choose to go down that route. And you also let Tyron Matthew walk in free agency and look at at the year that he's been having, the two years that he's been having with the Kansas City Chiefs. So a lot of question marks, a lot of uh, boneheaded decisions, I want to say, by the Bill O'Brien and the Houston Texans, and it just didn't make a lot of sense. So Romeo Cornell is now going to be the interim head coach. The executive vice president, Jack Easterby, is a name that was hired by Bill O'Brien. And he made the choice to fire the general manager at that time of the Houston Texans and give control to Bill O'Brien. Well, that guy, Jack Easterby, ended up being like, whoa, 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 what are you doing? We don't agree. We don't see eye to eye by a lot of these transactions that you're making. So I'm going to make the decision myself and I'm going to fire you. So the guy that Bill O'Brien was in charge of, pretty much in charge of hiring, turned around and he fired him. So I thought that was pretty funny. But he's in charge of picking a new head coach. And there's a lot of people, a lot of guys that in the NFL that a lot of people are talking about. There's, you know, the quarterback's coach of the Chargers with the work that he's been doing with uh, Justin Herbert, offensive coordinator of the Chiefs. There's, uh, I believe, Brian Dable is the offensive coordinator of the Bills. There's a lot of teams and a lot of um, coaching candidates out there for a lot of teams. And uh, we'll see down which route the Houston Texans elect to go to. But I do believe that this move of firing Bill O'Brien was the right move for the Houston Texans because after trying to be Bill Belichick for so long, listen, you can only do so much and you ended up failing. Next up is a coach that I thought personally was going to be the first head coach fired over Bill O'Brien, over anyone. Because 
there, it's New York, the media talks, and also there's just, in my eyes, a lot more controversy with this coach and the New York Jets than with Bill O'Brien with the Houston Texans. But he still has a job as of right now with this being week five, and that is Adam Gase. Adam Gase of the New York Jets has posted a 7-13 to record as head coach of the Jets. That's not the worst, especially if you haven't played that many games, 20 games. But there's a lot of things behind it and underlying things. If you look at the track record of Adam Gase and what he's done with the Miami Dolphins and people were even wondering when he got hired by the, the New York Jets, why is this guy getting hired by the Jets? Maybe it was his eyes that convinced him. I don't know. But Adam Gase has an 0-4 start to this year and looks like that they're going to be one of the worst teams in the NFL, if not the worst team. I know the other New York team, the New York Giants, are competing for that spot, but I believe that the Jets are much worse than the New York Giants. And Adam Gase is part of the issue in my eyes. So uh, if we look at uh, the underlying and the track record of uh, Adam Gase and what he did with the Miami Dolphins and why he has a job with the New York Jets. Let's actually take a little bit step backwards more than the Miami Dolphins and look at the success that he had with Peyton Manning and with the Denver Broncos. Okay, that catapulted his stock so much. He got hired by the Chicago Bears. One above average season by Jay Cutler was enough at that point. Oh, man, you did a great job with uh, uh, Peyton Manning in Denver. You did a great job with Jay Cutler in Chicago. Let's give you a head head coaching job. And at that time, it didn't seem like a bad decision to give a head coaching job to Adam Gase for the Miami Dolphins. But then, after his tenure with the Miami Dolphins, after those three or four seasons, I believe it was, with the Dolphins, having one playoff appearance, I'll give him credit to that, not doing much after that, gets hired by the New York Jets. Then we look at the players that he coached with the Miami Dolphins and why it didn't turn out well. And they go on to have successful seasons, either with a different team or with the same team. And you start to wonder with yourself, is Adam Gase to blame for the lack of success with Miami? A lot of examples that we can talk about. Seven I, I, I came up with that we can talk about. Let's talk about them. First, the quarterback, the most memorable, Ryan Tannehill. Had his best season as a Miami Dolphin, his sophomore season, 27 touchdowns, 12 interceptions, with Joe Philbin. His best years in Miami were with Joe Philbin. With Adam Gase, didn't do much. To the point that we're like, ah, let's just move on with him. Not a quarterback of the future. Goes on to Tennessee, and he proves, and he shows, like, hey, nothing's wrong with me. I'm a top 10 pick in the 2012 NFL Draft. And look at the success that I'm having with Tennessee, leading this team to the AFC Championship after taking over after four games uh, from Marcus Mariota in the 2019 season. So Ryan Tannehill is one example that went off to have success out of the control of Adam Gase. Kenyon Drake, another player that just got traded to Arizona in the last half of 2019 and just exploded. Was one of the better running backs in the NFL in the last half of the 2019 season. He was never seen as a bell cow back by Adam Gase. And right now you could debate, okay, well, Cliff Kingsbury, he's giving Chase Edmonds some carries. And yeah, Drake just isn't really doing that well right now. But at least he puts trust in him. At least he sees him as a three-down back like a lot of people did when he was in over he was over in Alabama. He had a split carries when he was in Alabama. But people saw him as a potential and the potential that he had as being an early pick in the second or third round, I believe, in the draft by the Miami Dolphins. Oh, this is the next uh, running back in the future for the Dolphins. Let's trade away Jay Ajayi and let's give the, the reins to Kenyon Drake. Never happened. Had he took, he took advantage of most of the opportunities that he had, but it was never given the full reins to be the lead bell cow back of the Miami Dolphins. Goes on to Arizona, explodes. Just one of those examples that does well after uh, leaving the reins of Adam Gase. Another example is Devontae Parker. Okay, so I dived a little bit deeper into this and what was kind of the uh, the beef that was going on with Adam Gase and Devontae Parker. I read a report like a year or two ago saying that Adam Gase thinks that Devontae Parker is soft. I don't know how true that is, but I dived a little bit deeper in that. And what I found was in October of 2018, during the 2018 NFL season, there was a game against Detroit where Devontae Parker was healthy. He was fully healthy. This is all according to his agent, uh, Jimmy Gould. 
He believes that he was fully healthy, and I'm going to pull up the quote right here. But said that he was fully healthy. Still, Adam Gase made him inactive and decided not to ride with Devontae Parker and instead trusted the likes of Albert Wilson and Danny Amendola to be their lead receivers in this game against Detroit when Devontae Parker could have made a much bigger impact. So I'm going to go ahead and show the quote real quick by this uh, by Jimmy Gold. This is the agent of Devontae Parker, and this is in response to Adam Gase choosing and electing to have Devontae Parker inactive in that game against Detroit. He says, No, I haven't, but I find the decision to make Devontae inactive today by Coach Gaze, Gaze with an, a Z, not S. Maybe that's in... That's foreshadowing. This is 2018 at that time. So maybe it's foreshadowing the press conference that he had with the Jets with the, the wide eyes look that he had with Coach Gaze, incompetent and insulting. Gold said in a statement obtained by Palacero. It's also just not true, and I'm sick of hearing him say my player is not healthy. This is the third game this year that Devontae should have played, and when you can include the Jets and New England. Devontae is healthy and with injuries, and the Dolphins... 6.1 yards per carry. This is how many yards per carry that they had in that game against Detroit uh, with Amendola and Wilson. Devontae could have and should have been allowed to contribute. What a horrific decision by Coach Gaze. Again, the Gaze. And he needs to take a very long look in the mirror and make himself inactive. That's actually pretty funny. <laughs> make himself inactive. Wow, that's uh, that was actually pretty smart and, and a good burn by uh, Jimmy Gold. So, that's kind of the beef with Devontae Parker and Adam Gase. What happens after that? Adam Gase gets fired. Devontae Parker has an amazing season with 1,200 yards receiving under the reins of Brian Flores, a new head coach, because they use him like the way that he should have been used this whole entire time. You got a guy that is maybe not as talented as Julio Jones, but physically he is built like Julio Jones. A big guy, 6'3", 215 pounds, fast as heck, a beast, can win 50-50 balls. They they chose and elected not to use him that way. Instead, more so a, a slot receiver. And Adam Gase, he, he just failed to use Devontae Parker the right way. And Devontae Parker goes on to have a successful season. So that's just another example of a player that does well outside of Adam Gase. Mike Gesicki. Mike Goat Siki, The fan favorite of Time to Football host Hassan Khan. 2018 being drafted, arguably the best tight end in that NFL draft, a big red zone target. You chose not to use him in the red zone. Instead, you had Dwayne Allen and Durham Smythe as starting tight ends over Mike Kosicki. Goes on to lead all tight ends and red zone targets so far in 2020. Big, athletic, having a breakout season. 6'6", 250 pounds, and led all tight ends in the 40-yard dash in 2018. Another example that's doing well outside of Adam Gase. Then you want to talk about the Jets? Let's talk about another Jets player. Let's talk about Robbie Anderson. Anderson was with the Jets in 2019. Didn't do much. Was inconsistent. Goes on to have a successful season. With Carolina, so far, as we know, the trusted target and the number one target for Teddy Bridgewater over DJ Moore, of all people. So Robbie Anderson is another example. This worries me with Adam Gase. And I believe that he needs to leave New York pretty quick because if you look at the players that he has right now, two examples that are really good, but I fear for them and their future. And one of them is just starting out and one of them is maybe so towards the tail end of his prime, but still has maybe one or two years left that he can be productive. Sam Darnold and Le'Veon Bell. Darnold, we all know about him. We all know how talented he is, and he was the right choice at the time by Todd Bowles and the New York Jets organization to be the quarterback of the New York Jets. Talented as heck. Arguably the best quarterback in that 2018 draft at that time. Now, we know that Josh Allen is having a successful season than Sam Darnold, but do we say that because... He was with the New York Jets, and he just doesn't have the right pieces around him. I mean, when your number one receiver is Jameson Crowder, good guy, great guy, great slot receiver, great guy that you can check down the ball to, PPR machine, but he's not that one-on-one -on -one player, that big beast, 6'3", 250 pounds, belt like Julio guy that you'd want. I know that they drafted Denzel Mims, but he's been hurt. So Adam Gase, people are fearing that they're wasting the talent that he has because if you've seen some of the throws that Sam Darnold has made, wonderful. They've been dots. They've been bullets. They've been on a rope. 
great player wasting his talent with New York. Le'Veon Bell, like we mentioned, towards the end of his prime, and he's not the same player that he was in Pittsburgh, but you sign him for this big contract to be this productive player, and he's not producing, and maybe that is because of Adam Gase. Maybe that is because he didn't use him as much as he wanted to or as much as people expected to in 2019. Maybe that is because you love Frank Gore so much that you signed him with the New York Jets, that you signed him with the Miami Dolphins, and you dipped into the production of Kenyon Drake, you dipped into the production of Le'Veon Bell, and you chose to go down that route instead of making Le'Veon Bell this three-down bell cow back that he's designed to be. So Adam Gase, a lot of issues with him. A lot of issues. And the offensive guru, genius, label that he has, I don't understand it. It, it, it's just a lingering concept and a lingering title that he's had since his days with Peyton Manning, and it's got to go. We've got to see Adam Gase as he truly is. We've seen him with the Miami Dolphins. We've seen him with the New York Jets. We've seen his true colors, and it is not the right fit. So Adam Gase has got to get out of there of New York. The next head coach that we want to talk about, man, something about advocating for people's jobs to be lost just gets me fired up. I mean, just look at these pit stains that I have on my shirt. I don't know if you guys can see or not. But it just gets me rallied up. It gets me heated. And this next one is definitely going to get me heated because I, as a Falcons fan, am in a crisis. I love Dan Quinn. DQ. As a person. But as a coach, man. As a coach. Oh, my gosh. I say it's time to go. Just me personally. Just looking at the the, the coaching that he's been, uh, or, or the positions that he's been putting the Falcons in for the past five years that he's been with the Atlanta Falcons, he puts us in positions to win. And that's it. And then anything after that is free game. We lose. After that, we blow the lead. And I wanted to really dive into this because is this a Dan Quinn issue or is it just luck of the draw, coincidence, just so happens that we blow a 25-point lead against the Patriots in the Super Bowl, blow a lead against Chicago, 16-point lead. We blow a lead against the Dallas Cowboys. Is this a reoccurring issue or is it just coincidence? So I want to do a little bit of research, and I found that Pro Football Reference, a very well-respected site, credible, gives any stats NFL-related, almost everything. They have the 50 biggest blown leads by the Atlanta Falcons on there. I think that's a dig to Atlanta, but they decided to create a whole entire page about it, and I believe you can find any other teams uh, as well. So the Patriots and Dolphins and any other team in the NFL, 50 biggest blown leads by the, by an organization. And I found the Atlanta Falcons. I'm going to throw it up on the uh, screen, and I wanted to see how many blown leads did Dan Quinn blow in his tenure with the Atlanta Falcons. So if we uh, pull, it up, pull up the graphic right here. So the most recent blown leads, obviously we know about the Chicago Bears, uh, we know about the Dallas Cowboys. That happened in uh, in 2020. That was a 16-point lead by the Bears. A 20-point lead by the Cowboys that was blown. Then you look back even further. You've got 2017, a couple games in 2017. This is post-Super Bowl. This is just fresh from the Super Bowl, by the way. So we, Atlanta, fan, uh, Atlanta fans, we're triggered, okay? We, we are triggered. We don't want to see another blown lead, but it happens. In 2017, against the Carolina Panthers, we blew a 10-point lead against the Miami Dolphins. In 2017, a 17-point a blown, uh, blown lead. And then obviously you yeah, have the, the Super Bowl, which is the most memorable. That was a 25-point uh, lead that was blown. And then before that, I remember this game too. San Diego Chargers in 2016, 30-33 to was the final score. We blew a 17-point lead. I remember that game. And then against the Colts in 2015, we blew a 14-point lead. So you look at these most recent blown leads – by the Atlanta Falcons, granted in 2018 and 2019, there's no record of that. But this is a reoccurring issue of Dan Quinn. The defense is not that good, I understand. The offense is fantastic, but missed some pieces here and there. The offensive line has been bad for so uh, for so long. You could do so much with the defense, with the offense, and even though it may not be the best roster, this roster that they have is at least good enough, I would say, to go maybe seven and nine, eight and eight, maybe compete for a playoff spot, maybe nine and seven. Who knows? At the very least. But somehow, some way, 0 and 4. Should be 2 and 2, but it's 0 and 4. So uh, at this point, Dan Quinn and, 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 like I mentioned, Thomas Dimitrov, the general manager, they're on the hot seat, and Dimitrov has been on the hot seat for the last five, 10 years, ever since his days with Mike Smith. But uh, Dan Quinn, 
He's 43 to 41. That's his record uh, in the uh, tenure that he's been with the Atlanta Falcons. Only two winning seasons in the last five years. And this will be another losing season. So two winning seasons in six years. The Super Bowl started it. The Super Bowl started his decline. And that was the one window in the 2016 season that you had to win a Super Bowl, that you had a roster good enough to win the Super Bowl. And then the Mercedes-Benz Stadium opens up. Okay, well, maybe the 2017 season. You're still in that window. You still have plenty of the uh, of the same players. You can still win. Even though you lost Kyle Shanahan, you can still win. And after blowing whatever it was against the Philadelphia Eagles and uh, the playoffs and just costing that game and not winning it, that's when the window just kind of fizzled out and now they're in a real rebuilding process you got to start all over if you want to get back to the Super Bowl so these blown leads are coaching issues whether it be Kyle Shanahan we know we talked about uh, him earlier in in a previous episode blowing the lead with the Atlanta Falcons in the Super Bowl but also blowing the lead with the San Francisco 49ers this could also be a Dirk Cutter their offensive coordinator right now but this is just all coaching whether it be a staff thing you need to get rid of offensive coordinators and head coaches I believe at this point, you got to get rid of the head coach. You got to move on from Dan Quinn, even though the players love him, even though in 2019, they rallied in the second half after starting one and seven and then finishing that season uh, seven and nine. At this point, you got to move on with Dan Quinn. The final head coach that we want to talk about is not under the same kind of pressure and fire or media coverage from uh, a lot of people as in maybe Adam Gase or Dan Quinn or uh, Bill O'Brien, but Matt Patricia is a candidate to be in the hot seat, and to lose his job in 2020, mainly because of the lack of success that he's been having since he took over in 2018. 10 wins, 25 losses, and only or one tie. So only 10 wins in his tenure since 2018. But also because of the post-game comments, oh my gosh, that he made uh, after his game with the New Orleans Saints. He stated after talking about or talking about how you can turn this team around and talking about the loss, he talked about how uh, this team in the situation that he's in was inherited uh, when he stepped in in 2018. Talked about how he had a lot of work to do and he still has a lot of work to do because of the situation that he picked up when he stepped in as the head coach. A lot of players, a lot of fans did not like that. We're not fond of that because that means that you're finger pointing. You're putting the blame on someone else saying, hey, you, you're the one at fault for this and it's nothing to do with me. I'm trying to help. I'm trying to do my job. I'm trying to turn this team around. But you did such a crappy job before me that it's all your fault. You know how like a a Republican president takes over for a Democratic president or if a Democratic president takes over for a Republican president and they end up, there's some controversy or they end up not doing that good of a job uh, as a president, then they're going to say, hey, listen, look at the president before me. Look at the situation that I inherited. It's all their fault. They're the ones to blame, and that's the exact same thing that Matt Patricia is doing as a head coach of the Detroit Lions. Dan Orlovsky, the quarterback of the Detroit Lions from uh, 2005 to to, uh, 2008, and then again, I believe, in 2014 through 2015 or 2016, I believe, uh, has been playing in the NFL since 2005, since he was drafted uh, by the Lions in the fifth round. If you don't if you're not familiar with Dan Orlovsky, just type in Dan Orlovsky safety, 2008. Then you'll remember. But Dan Orlovsky is now an ESPN analyst and a, uh, a host, and he does a fantastic job. Love Dan Orlovsky. Love his inside of the game, and uh, he's very knowledgeable. But he was talking about Matt Patricia, and he's talking about the Detroit Lions. And he was in that, in his second tenure with the Lions, he was involved with Jim Caldwell. And Caldwell, as a head coach of the Detroit Lions, taking over for Jim Schwartz, in that time era, uh, was really, really good for the Lions, given the situation that they were in, given Detroit Lions standards. You want to talk about his record? He was 11-5 as his first year as a head coach, developed one of the best defenses in the NFL in the Detroit Lions. Then he starts off not so hot, 1-7, just like Dan Quinn in 2019. Same situation. The players like to rally around him. Uh, he's a good leader, and so they want to play for him. And he ended up finishing the season seven and nine, and essentially saving his job with the Detroit Lions. Uh, then the season after after that, his third season, he went nine and seven, and then the season after that, he was nine and seven as well. Had a couple of playoff appearances uh, as well, but he lost in the first round, so we really didn't get far in that case. But at that point. They fired him because they were like, 9-7 and seven is not that good. I mean, it's an above-average record, but he failed to beat better teams. 
uh, in the NFL. So given that, his team, the Detroit Lions, Jim Caldwell's Detroit Lions were 9-7. and seven, A 9-7 and seven franchise that you took over, Matt Patricia, and you're saying that you inherited a bad situation? Matthew Stafford was playing his best football, some of his best football in that era when he was with Jim Caldwell. He's had proven success. He's coached in a Super Bowl. Caldwell has for the Indianapolis Colts in 2009. And you're saying that you were in a bad situation when you took over for the Detroit Detroit Lions. So that irked Dan Orlovsky because he was in that locker room. He knew that Jim Caldwell was a good coach. And he said that players played for him because he was a good leader. And they wanted the best. He wanted the best out of his players. And Orlovsky said, listen, Matt Patricia, you have no idea what you're talking about. So that irked him. Glover Quinn is a familiar name if you're a Detroit Lions fan. A defensive back, very good defensive back at that point, was upset with the comments that Matt Patricia made of the Detroit Lions inheriting a bad situation. So Patricia at this point, oh my gosh, 10 wins, 25 losses. That's in itself is not good enough to be a head coach in the NFL, to continue to be a head coach. It's not like you're in your, in your first season or your second season, and you're still kind of developing and you sign a big, long contract. But uh, at this point, after the comments that they made, it's time for the Lions to move on from Matt Patricia. Patriots coaches, I don't know what it is. Coordinators, defensive coordinators, offensive coordinators, somehow, some way, they end up not doing so well in the NFL. We talked about Bill O'Brien earlier. Josh McDaniels is another example. And Matt Patricia is, an, is the most recent example of that as well. So Patricia... For the Detroit, Detroit Lions, not a good fit. Time for the Lions to move on and find a new head coach. Now we're going to get into the part of the show where we answer fantasy football questions because you guys are wonderful. Uh, and leaving your comments and your questions in those starts and sets of videos that we have every single Tuesday, you guys are the lifeline of this channel. So I want to do my part in rewarding you guys and getting back to you guys and interacting with all of y'all and making this uh, more of like a, a conversation than more so than me being better than you and you just watching me. So I'm going to try my best to respond to these questions. I picked out a, a few of these. So if you guys see your questions, uh, you know, this is going to be very helpful to you. But if you also are an owner of one of these uh, players that we're going to be talking about, pay close attention because this could help you guys out as well. By the way, these comments were derived from uh, YouTube comments from those Starts and Sits videos. Have you guys noticed, or is it just me, that there are a lot of bots, a lot of spam in the comments? I mean, I, I, I just look on there because I was trying to pick out comments for this video. And I noticed there was a lot of Asian bots in the comment section. And I'm, I don't mean to attach a race to uh, these bots and this these spam that I've been getting, but the fact it, facts are facts. They're Asian. That's just what they are. So I've been doing my absolute best to respond to these uh, spam comments and these bots and saying like, oh, you know, my hot brunette wife could beat you up and like, uh, you're reporting them and blocking them, but hey, if if you want to help, you can s- report them as spam as well, and maybe that'll clean up the comment section a bit, and a lot more people can just feel comfortable leaving their comments, and it's not going to get overlooked because the spam is really taking over, honestly, and it's really hard to answer these questions with all the spam going on. So please report those Asian bots. Let's get rid of them. Now for fancy football questions. This first question that we have from YouTuber underestimation with an X and 7 This sounds like an odd question, but start Kyler or Bridgewater. Listen, man, there is no such thing as an odd question in fantasy football because you you really don't know what's going to happen. Luck is luck, okay? You could start Kyler Murray, which you expect to be a very good quarterback, just totally flop against a bad defense like the New York Jets. It just happens. It happens in fantasy football. So no such thing as an odd question in fantasy football. But who I, who would I take Kyler Murray against the Jets or Teddy Bridgewater against the Falcons? I would put my faith and all my trust into Kyler Murray against the Jets. Listen, this guy, I know that Kyler Murray has kind of faulted sometimes. You know, he, Passing-wise, he may not be the best currently in the last two games against the Lions and the Panthers. But his rushing ability and trying to keep the Cardinals in the game, it's all that you need. So, 
against a bad defense like the Jets, I would put your trust in Kyler Murray because this guy is up there in the tier of Dak Prescott, Russell Wilson, Lamar Jackson, Patrick Mahomes. He's probably number five uh, for me. Maybe Josh Allen is, is higher than him, but probably Kyler Murray is teetering towards that top five fantasy football quarterback. So I would start Kyler Murray over Teddy Bridgewater, regardless of, of how good of a matchup Bridgewater has. This next one from Kev Yogg. How can you recommend Baker Mayfield in one video and turn around and say that he will be a bust? Okay, so the Tuesday morning, every Tuesday morning, we, we come out with uh, our waiver wire pickups. And we talked about Baker Mayfield, how he is the ad of the week for quarterbacks. Then we turn around and say that he is the bust of the week for quarterbacks for week five. When I make those videos about ads and drops, that's not so much for streaming just for that week. Because that's for starts and sits, okay? If you want to know who to start and sit, go to the start and sit video. But if you want to know who to add and who to drop to make your team better for the long run, then you watch that video and then you'll see that Baker Mayfield is on that list because I know this matchup against the Colts is bad in week five, but you look at his, I believe his next five matchups after that. He's facing the Bengals. He's facing the Texans. This is in no order, but... The Bengals, the Texans, the Jaguars, the Raiders. Uh, I believe Pittsburgh is in there as well, which may be kind of tough. But Pittsburgh, you'd be surprised, isn't that isn't too bad of a matchup for a quarterback. So uh, that's why I recommend adding Baker Mayfield as a good backup. And if your starting quarterback has a bye in the next five, six games, and he has one of those good matchups coming up, Start Baker Mayfield. But as far as starting him this week, he's the bust of the week against the Colts. I I don't know whether the Colts defense is really good or they've just been facing really bad teams or if the Browns are really good or they've just been facing really bad teams, uh, bad defenses at least. But we're going to find out with our answer and it's better to be safe than sorry and just bench Baker Mayfield. But I would add him for the long run as your backup quarterback. This next one is from XSE. P picks. I just gave up on that YouTuber name. I don't know. I got the kicker in the defense of the Colts, and they performed well. Should I swap them this week or hold on because the matchup is hard for them now? I would appreciate an answer and advice from you. The Colts kicker, Rodrigo Blankenship, dude is the most underrated pickup in fantasy football when it comes to the kicker position. Him and Jason Myers. If those guys are still available and you're riding with guys that you, because you just don't care about the kicker position. You're like, ah, oh, kickers aren't football players. We don't care about it. We don't care about them in fantasy football. If you're riding with the likes of uh, psh, people that you drafted, like Chris Boswell or uh, Jake Elliott and people like that, I would highly recommend that you draft or you pick up Jason Myers or Rodrigo Blankenship well over any of those guys. He's going to be a top 10, if dare I say, top five fantasy kicker at the end of the 2020 season. Respect the specs, baby. UJ is fine. It's Rodrigo Blankenship is in every start for me at this point every single week. So I would start Rodrigo Blankenship against the Cleveland Browns. As far as the Colts defense, whenever I don't mention a, a defense as a start or a sit in one of those videos, yeah, they could be more so a start. I just didn't have enough room for them in that video or a, a sit. But I believe most of the time when I mention or don't mention a player to be start or sit, it's mainly because they are going to be nothing more than average. And I believe that's going to happen with the Colts. A Colts uh, defense that is very good and has been proven to be good for the past few weeks. But a Browns offense that has really stepped it up and has scored more than 30 points in the last three games. So I would go ahead and just sit the Colts if you can, if you don't have any other option. Because the Bills defense, the, Col uh, the Chiefs defense, the Titans defense, the... Can we just talk about it for a sec? The Patriots defense as well. I didn't have a chance to talk about COVID earlier, but dude, COVID is going to mess up this week of fantasy football, man. I'm worried, man. I'm worried. I own Bills players. I own Titans players, Chiefs players. It's, this game is probably not going to be happening with the Bills and the Titans at this point, it seems like. But man, oh man, oh man, I, I, I feel for you guys too. Listen, I'm in the same boat. Okay, I've had multiple injuries happen to me, you know, and the injury apocalypse that happened in week one and week two uh, with Saquon Barkley getting hurt. Le'Veon Bell got hurt for me as well. Tevin Coleman for me got hurt. Debo Samuel got hurt. 
uh, just so many injuries happen. And then now you have this COVID stuff happening with, uh, I got Corey Davis. I've got Devin Singletary. I've got Stefan Diggs. I picked up the chiefs defense. I have the bills defense. It's just Harrison Butker. It, it, it's a mess, man. I, I just, I feel for you guys. If you're in the same situation as me, because I don't know what I'm going to do, but the bright side of this though, is that this is going to be a bye week for some of these players. So in the future, when other people have players on a bye, your players are going to be playing. So that is something to look forward to. But for this week, gut it out, man. Whew, work out the waivers. So if you, the Colts are your only option at this point, start the Colts, man. Start the Colts. It's not going to hurt you. Next one, J. Will, LOL. I ain't touching Drake, IDC. I don't care who he plays. Hey, I, don't, I feel you, bro. I feel you. I talked about this with Joe Mixon when I talked about the hungriest player of the week. I talked about Joe Mixon and Kenyon Drake for the past two weeks. The two players that you have to be the most patient with because they're both in the same position. Joe Mixon uh, was top five in touches and attempts uh, out of all running backs. And Kenyon Drake, I believe he's up there. I believe he's seventh in the NFL right now in carries for running backs. You just got to be patient. The matchup has to be right. And... Something just has to click with that Arizona offense. That's what happened with Cincinnati. They were just losing games. They were just putting in Giov- Giovanni Bernard too much, too much, too many times, taking too many snaps. And then eventually the Bengals had that matchup right in the in, in the eyes of Joe Mixon. It was perfect. That run defense is the perfect defense to run against to have the, a breakout game. And this Jets defense is the best defense to have that breakout game as well with Kenyon Drake. I listed him as a sleeper of the week because a lot of people are, are losing hope with them with Kenyon Drake, but be patient. Just like Joe Mixon, be patient at least for the next couple weeks. And then after a couple weeks, if he's still the same Kenyon Drake, move on with him, trade him away, uh, drop him if you really have to, but give it two weeks. And I, I, if I was a Kenyon Drake owner, I would start him this week against the New York Jets. Next one from Alyssa Liu. Can someone tell me why is Le'Veon Bell a must start? I have him. And find it so hard to trust him. I have Damian Harris, Melvin Gordon, David Johnson, Joshua Kelly, and Eckler. Okay, so let me cl- uh, clarify this. It, it, those players that you have, I would start most of those players over Le'Veon Bell. I would at least start David Johnson this week and Josh Kelly over Le'Veon Bell. Bell, so far, has not even been activated from IR. We expect him to be activated from IR. Oh my gosh, I hope, man, because my fantasy team is with this COVID stuff I need. Le'Veon Bell so bad. Uh, but we expect him to be activated off of IR, and this matchup against Arizona is the perfect matchup to start Le'Veon Bell. Here's a stat that, uh, is it Mike Clay? Is that the ESPN analyst for fantasy football? This is a stat that he picked up on in week one with the Jets before he got hurt in uh, the first five minutes of the third quarter. Le'Veon Bell, for that game against the Bills, was in on 100% of snaps. Didn't get 100% of the carries, okay? Because they gave a couple to Frank Gore while Bell was healthy. But he was in on 100% of the snaps, dude. That tells me that Bell is going to be utilized by Adam Gase. Gase, a guy that has nothing to lose, has this stigma of not using his players properly, has gotten controversial comments before about Le'Veon Bell not using him properly and not using him as a three-down back. Nothing to lose. You want to save your job? Just let Le'Veon Bell loose. So that's why I believe that Bell, against a good matchup with the Cardinals, getting 100% of snaps is going to be a great play against the Cardinals. However, I would start David Johnson and Josh Kelly personally over Le'Veon Bell, but as far as Damian Harris or Melvin Gordon, I kind of explained Melvin Gordon that starts and sits video, but with Damian Harris especially, it's too early to really pick up on uh, is he going to be a good productive back for the Patriots every single week. I would choose Bell over those two. Uh, this last one, let's do one more, is from Pranesh Daniel. Would you start the Arizona Cardinals or the Kansas City Chiefs? Dude, I would start the Chiefs, but I just talked about COVID, man. I talked about COVID. I, I, I really don't know, I, to be honest with you. So if we talk about the Chiefs and the Cardinals, and the reason I'm talking about COVID is because the Raiders actually had a player who tested positive Wednesday morning. Uh, so that Chiefs and Raiders game might be in jeopardy. He may just need to be quarantined if there's no more positive tests. But 
the Cardinals and the Chiefs, if we're just talking about a football perspective, if both teams are going to play, I would start the Chiefs because they have, I believe, six sacks in the last three games. And uh, the, the Raiders have given up seven sacks in that time span as well. As well as six turnovers caused by the Raiders' offense. And the Chiefs picked up six turnovers as well. So the Chiefs have a good matchup against Las Vegas, a team that is kind of lost offensively without their top wideout in Henry Ruggs. For the Cardinals, yeah, I like them. But I just talked about Le'Veon Bell. And I talked about how this team could... This run defense is kind of sketch and giving up a lot of fantasy points to the likes of like Mike Davis and other running backs that they face. So I would start Le'Veon Bell uh, against the Cardinals, and that could be the downfall uh, for the Cardinals as well. Though, if the Chiefs don't play, then the Cardinals would be a fine play as well. Oh my gosh, there's just a lot of headaches going on with uh, everything going on with the injuries and COVID and... I don't know. We're going to have to find out and see what happens. So stay updated with all of those news. That's pretty much going to do it for this week's episode of Time to Football. Again, if you guys are watching this video up on YouTube, we appreciate you guys joining us and uh, coming along with the ride this whole entire time and staying with us all the way through the end. And if you guys are listening to this podcast up on iTunes, just be sure to head over to our YouTube channel because we have much more content on there that comes out uh, on YouTube than it does over on iTunes. YouTube.com slash Time to Football. And over on iTunes, it's you search the uh, podcast app and search for Time to Football, rate and review, leave five stars. It would help us out so, so much. With all that said, thank you guys so much for watching this episode of Time to Football, and I'll see you next week. Mm-hmm.